Good morning, friends, and welcome to Life Connection Baptist Church. Uh, I hope you've been enjoying the beautiful weather. I mean, if, if there's nothing else we can do right now, we can certainly get out and enjoy the world that God has made, the springtime and all the, the fresh air and the beautiful flowers and everything coming back to life. And friends, we have that to look forward to ourselves. We have a new spring ahead of us as uh, this lockdown comes to an end. Uh, but we also know we have that eternal spring ahead of us in salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we come and we, we lift praise to him for that. He deserves glory. He deserves praise and honor. And it is our privilege to be able to do that, especially now. Uh, since we can't come together in one place, and yet we can, across this entire, what, three counties, we can be together and we can praise our Lord. So, friends, I'm going to say in a few minutes as we sing here, let the Lord hear your voice. Lift it loud. Maybe people walking by this morning will, will hear you singing praise to God, and, and maybe their heart will be turned to praise him too. But just remember, you, where you are right now, it is a sanctuary to the Lord. It is the temple of God. His spirit is there, and he is enjoying every moment of the praise you and your family give to him in the honor of Jesus' name. Let's pray. Father God, this morning is yours and we delight in you. We celebrate your life and the life that allows us to, to continue moment by moment and day by day and, and, and endure even difficult situations like we're in now knowing not only is there an end to this ahead, Lord, there is heaven forever before us. And so, Lord, help us in this time to, to open our eyes and our hearts, to, to set aside the stresses and the de-stresses that, that weigh on us right now. And just remember, you are good, you are holy, you are beautiful, and for no reason other than who you are, you love us. And you have chosen to make us your children. Thank you, Father. And may the worship and the praise of your people be delightful in your eyes this morning. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome back, everybody. Good evening. I guess Sunday morning Welcome back. that you Welcome are with back. us. Um, it's Friday back. evening here as we're recording, but we'll be with you on Sunday morning. With us. With you. With them. Worshiping. Together. Yes. Give him praise. Mm -hmm.
morning everyone hey if you've been with us through this series on joy you've noticed it's been something of a bumpy ride of course right now I think everything's a bit of a bumpy ride uh, but we've we've gone through and we've searched far and wide in God's uh, word uh, trying to build an accurate picture of what exactly biblical joy is uh, we followed the paths of some of the Scottish and English uh, reformers of the 17th century and uh, from their Westminster Catechism, we saw uh, that they said very well that the chief end of man, the highest purpose we have, is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Uh, our purpose is to enjoy God, and that joy is specifically found in our glorifying Him. Uh, so from that, we came up with our definition of biblical joy. Biblical joy is a response to experiencing the glory of Jesus Christ. 
joy is of God. It, it's not experienced apart from God. In fact, our sense of joy is very much tied uh, into our ongoing experience of Jesus. Uh, specifically, we experience the joy of the Lord in our relationship with and through him. Uh, we, we experience it in his presence. Psalm 1611 tells us, uh, in your presence, God, is fullness of joy. In your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Speaking to that, um, that desire, that need in us, and his desire for us to enjoy him. Uh, we experience God's joy in participation with his purposes. He says, be holy as I am holy. Love as I loved you. Go and make disciples. And as we do these things, we find the joy of the Lord. Uh, we discover God's joy in praise. Psalm 98.1 says, Shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth. Break forth and sing for joy and sing praises. Psalm 22.3 tells us God is enthroned in the praises of his people. A piece of that joy that we can enjoy, uh, we can know and find strength in, in God is found in praising him together. Um, speaking of together, we find joy in fellowship with his people. Um, this is my family. These are my people, he says. Yeah. And who is it? Those people who hear and do the word of the Lord. And because of his work in our lives, we are one. Because our Lord Jesus Christ makes us one. And there's great joy in that. Uh, there's joy in the peace of God, knowing that we will no longer face righteous condemnation for our sin. Rather, instead, we've been adopted by God as his children. What joy in the presence of God and knowing he is our eternal father. In every way, biblical joy, true joy, it's bound up in our relationship with Jesus as Savior and Lord. And we've seen, because of that, joy is a fruit, a work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Uh, the Holy Spirit produces joy within us. We can't produce it. it it's his work. Uh, Psalm 4, 7 and 8 says, You, O Lord, have put gladness in my heart. More, more than when there's a great harvest and, and new wine being made. Lord, you have put joy in my heart. In peace, I will both lie down and sleep. Why? Because you alone, O Lord, make me to dwell in safety. Or Romans 14, 17. The kingdom of God is not in eating and drinking. Yes, even for us Baptists. But the kingdom of God is in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. You find righteousness, you find peace, you find joy, all coming from the Holy Spirit that lives within us as children of God. And because joy is a fruit of the Spirit, we have learned that joy is greater than any of our circumstances. Uh, you can see that in Paul's testimony to God in Romans 8, starting in verse 35. Now, he asked the rhetorical question, who will separate us from the love of Christ? No one. Uh, will tribulation, distress, per persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword? No. Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all the day long. We were considered as sleep to be slaughtered. Yeah, sleep, sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. And he, here's this this. I love this. For I am convinced, Paul says, I am convinced neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor heights nor depths nor any created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wow, what, what powerful truth. Uh, just showing how the joy of God is capable of so much more than even the worst circumstance we live in. And so, therefore, with all of that going together, we've seen living in joy is a choice. It's a choice we make. It is uh, separate, apart from our circumstances. It's a choice, and it is a command. God 
doesn't just give us the option. He commands that we enjoy him, that we abide in his joy. We'll see in Philippians 4.4, 4, uh, the command says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And in case we're slow and don't get it, I say it again, command it again, rejoice. Uh, so guys, the joy of the Lord is always available to us. We, we choose whether or not we remain in it or allow circumstances and fear and trial to overcome us. But that's why the joy of the Lord is our strength, as we saw in Nehemiah 8. Because when we choose faith, when we choose trust and hope in Jesus, that supernatural joy of the Lord enables us to stand in him through any circumstance. So the joy of the Lord, that, that's what we're looking at. And it is central to who we are and who we are meant to to be in Christ. And while we have scoured over scripture to understand joy, we now come to the place where we turn from that broad scope to uh, looking through the entire Bible as we have. Instead, we're going to try to understand joy through a single book of the Bible. We're going to move from that 30,000 foot view, if you will, to the, the 30 foot view and see how God explains joy to us through one letter, one epistle, the letter of joy. It's Paul's letter to the church of Philippi. So in a moment, we're going to look in our Bibles and begin reading there. If you want to go ahead and open to the book of Philippians. Uh, but that's where we're going to be for the next several weeks, and I hope that you can be with us through this whole study as we see what God's intent is. But first, let's start with prayer. Father God, we want and need your joy, and we have learned that joy comes in relationship with you. And so first, Father, I come before you and I admit I am an unworthy vessel. I sin, I have turned willingly from you. And Father, I repent of that and I ask that you would wash that away and cover my sin with the blood of your son, that you might fill me even now and speak through me, that your people might hear, that your son might be glorified. And Father, as we come before you and enjoy you and see you for who you are, that we might know your joy and the strength to stand in who you are and who you've called us and make us to be because the joy of your presence is the strength we need to move forward. Father, speak now. Let your word come through clearly and may your people grow and may those who do not yet know you as Lord and Savior, may they, their eyes be opened and their hearts pricked, Lord, to, to hear the message that there is salvation available in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. So if you'll look in your Bibles with me, we will read the first 11 verses of the book of Philippians. So Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Paul and Timothy, voluntary servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all, in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. And it is right for me to feel this way about you all because I have you in my heart since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of grace with me. And for God is my witness how I long for you all with an affection, the affection of Christ. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Christ Jesus to the glory and the praise of God. Friends, I think our enemy works overtime to make us believe that joy is 
difficult in times like these today. Um, and when we have this misplaced happiness, this idea that happiness and joy are, are equated, um, it's pretty easy for us to get sidelined. Happiness is based in happenings. Joy is based in the unchanging reality of God. And, and so having walked through this over the last several weeks, I praise God today that he's moving us to dig deeply into his joy now, uh, knowing that we were headed into this global circumstance that we're all dealing with right now. And he was preparing us to face it in him. And yet I am awestruck that in his wisdom and timing, he didn't have us focus on joy, you know, like last year so we could like get ready or something. No, he waited until the perfect moment leading right into this because here's the thing, the wind that separates the wheat from the chaff, that fire that purifies gold from the dross, that's hardship, that is trial, it is the pain, the fear, the testing of these current circumstances that reveal to us the necessary difference between happiness and joy. And God is doing that for us even now. Um, and Paul got that. He got that difference. I mean, did you catch what he said about himself in those verses? It, it was in verse 7. Uh, Paul said that the Philippians are partakers. They're participants with him in his imprisonment, his imprisonment and the defense of the gospel. You see, Paul is writing this letter while he is in prison. Most likely, this is while he was in Rome. You, know, you might recall that he'd been arrested in Jerusalem. Uh, the Holy Spirit told him that would happen. And they planned to assassinate him there. So uh, the governor whisked him away to Caesarea. And he was under house arrest there for two years trying to convince Felix of the gospel. But finally, uh, Paul appealed to Caesar and was sent to Rome, shipwreck and everything on the way. Wonderful story. I'm sure it's just the highlight of his life. But here's the point. His joy continued through it all. And here he is in Rome, and he's going to be under house arrest for another two years, continuously chained to a member of the Praetorian Guard. And, and that's where he is as he writes this or, or dictates it, whichever he did. And he's writing this letter of joy from a prison. Guys, Paul is going to weave the glory of Jesus and his love and acceptance of us with our proper response in joy uh, to, to work, to in service, and in thought. So joy, work, and thought. And, and Philippians is full of a lot of practical teaching on all of these areas. But what we need to understand is they are centered in the work of God in our lives and our joyous response to that work, regardless of the circumstances we find ourselves in. Now, you also need to know, Paul had a very special relationship with the Philippians. Uh, he, along with Silas, uh, Timothy, and most likely Luke, because he's the one who wrote about it, uh, they planted the church in Philippi. So uh, these people, the Philippians, were very dear and very well known to Paul. And what happened is they heard that Paul was imprisoned in Rome. And when they heard that, their response was to take up an offering, to, to put it in the hands of a trusted elder, Epaphras, and send that to Rome to help provide for Paul. Because back then, your only provision in prison was what others gave you. I mean, if you died in prison because no one fed you, that was on you, not the, not the Roman government. And so... This gift and this act of love meant a whole lot to Paul. Uh, typically, you were lucky if your closest family members even maintained their ties with you if you were under arrest and waiting trial. Because you see, uh, the, the arm of Roman justice, you know, when it came down on a, con a, con a convicted person, it wasn't always very careful about who uh, got taken down with them. In fact, it's it just the opposite. Many times... In an order to try and stamp out criminality and, and, and issues in the, uh, the Roman Empire, they would take the person who was guilty and those people closest to them and then stomp them all out. Uh, so 
most people had left Paul by this point. Four years of imprisonment, waiting to, uh, for his appeal to go to Caesar. And Paul himself is going to tell us he had Timothy. He had the Philippians uh, via Epaphras. Uh, Epaphras uh, and he had this rotating Roman guard he was chained to. Uh, so in one sense, we might understand that Paul is overjoyed uh, because somebody still cares, because they're risking reaching out to him and providing for his needs. But here's the thing. The letter of Philippians makes it clear to us. Paul is content in whatever provision he has. His joy is not just that he has heard of their love again and they've met his needs. His joy is solidly in the gospel being shared. Here's what he says later. We'll get back to it again. But here's what he says in Philippians 4 verse 10. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly now that you have revived your concern for me. In fact, y'all were concerned before, but you didn't have an opportunity to show it. But not that I'm speaking for want, but you see, I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am in. That's joy right there, friends. He, he says, I know how to get along with humble means. I know how to live in prosperity. I, I've had in any and every circumstances, I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, of having abundance and suffering need. And here's what the secret is. You ready? In case you didn't know this, this is the secret to all of that. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you've done well to share with me in my affliction. Guys, Paul appreciated the support the Philippians were giving, but that's not his source of joy. What is it he's rejoicing in? He's rejoicing in their participation in the gospel of Christ. And, and it's not just that he's not alone, it's that he's not alone in seeing the work of the gospel being done. And so we, we read it a minute ago. What was his prayer for them back in uh, Philippians 1, 9 through 11? I pray this, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and discernment so you can approve, you can know and say, yes, this is right, the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of of God. Guys, we're going to get to see so many ways that the joy and glory of the gospel in Christ Jesus sustains Paul in the midst of all he does and, and can sustain us in the, the days and the weeks ahead as we move through our circumstance today. But I want to start today and just take this little snippet, these, these 11 verses to remind us of one piece of the power of joy. Um, to remind us, if you will, in the midst of our imprisonment, um, our, our circumstance, that the joy of the Lord is still there, and it is still our strength. And that joy, as we see in these verses, is specifically found in one another in the family of God. Uh, loved ones, we, we in the, the, the body of Christ, we share a common work, a common purpose. We share a bond in Christ that is stronger than even blood family. We, we share an understanding that this life is not everything and neither our present circumstances um, are um, our present circumstances are not everything. Our, this life is not everything. We know that. Uh, we share a peace and a faith that can say with Paul a few verses later in uh, verses 18 and 20, he says, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance, that I will not be put to shame in anything, and Christ will be exalted, whether by life or by death. Loved ones, today Jesus Christ is being proclaimed more boldly and with greater reach than I think at any time that I can remember in my life. We, a little tiny church of 50-ish people on a good Sunday, we are easily reaching 100, 150 people every single Sunday because we're on the internet now. That's a work of God, friends. People out there need answers. They, they want comfort. And what better opportunity for us to show that we're more than a book club or a social group? Loved ones, we have the hope of the world. We know the joy of the Lord. And we have this deep fellowship with one another that 
even though we can't see each other, we speak and we talk and we, we're there with and for each other and we know that. Uh, friends, Christ is being exalted in the world today and, and I know whatever comes, whether in life or in death, in plenty or in need, we will not be put to shame because just like Paul, whatever comes, we know can only be for our deliverance. In this life, through these circumstances, or to eternal life, being rescued for them once and for all. There is no downside for us in these circumstances. So guys, rest in God's joy. Jesus is glorified and we have nothing to fear. Reach out in his love. The world needs it now more than ever. Share, share your stories of what God is doing in your life. And what have you seen him do? Let people know, let us know so we can be encouraged by that. What are you doing even now to help further the work of Christ? Guys, let us know and we'll pray together for that. What can you do? What, what does God want to do through you tomorrow and the day after that if he gives it to us? Friends, Paul summed it up when he said, I can do all things through him, through Christ who strengthens us. And how does he strengthen us? He told us again back in uh, Nehemiah 8, he strengthens us through his joy. Friends, the world and everything in it has been shaken. So let the world see your unshakable faith and joy in our Lord Jesus Christ today. Let me pray this over all of us. Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and do not forget any of his benefits. He who forgives all your sin, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life out of the pit of hell, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. But don't forget, he will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. Yet he has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness to those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sins from us. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He is mindful that we are but dust. But the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. And his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember his commands to do them. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens. His sovereignty rules over all. Bless the Lord, you angels, mighty in strength, who perform his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you hosts who serve him, doing his will. Bless the Lord, all you works of his in all places of his dominion. And yes, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Amen, amen, so May it be. Pray with me. Father, let our souls bless you. Let us not forget your great worth and your gifts to us and your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let your perfect loving kindness fill us and guard us and carry us safely into your presence forevermore. And Father, let us, like everything of your creation, proclaim the goodness of your name that people would hear and know of the love in Jesus Christ, the salvation bought by his blood, that we would profess his name until he return. And we lift this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
cry.